Welcome, everybody. I'm Eitan Butler, chairman at Dalmore Group, and today I am joined with my good friend Shari Noonan, the CEO and founder at Rialto Markets, uh, an award-winning broker-dealer focused on both primary issuance as well as secondary market trading through their ATS, as well as another very close friend of mine, Sarah Judd, uh, the one and only uh, Chief Operating Officer at North Capital, a revolutionary broker-dealer specializing in financial technology, secondary trading, escrow, and custody for private securities offerings, and my brother Tim Nersten, <laughs> Head of Partnerships at e and Ecosystem at um, Templum, a broker-dealer that, that provides infrastructure for investing and trading alternative assets. Um, we're going to do something a little bit interesting today. Rather than kind of talk about the industry, where it's coming from, and where we think it might be going, we're going to go right into kind of what issuers today are, are asking a lot of us. What's going on on the front lines? And we're going to kind of go through the questions. Uh, we'll alternate. Um, feel free to cut me off any time or cut each other off, but it's more, you know, just kind of, you know, to have this, this general type of uh, approach towards the discussion. We'll start with Sarah. Uh, question, why is access to secondary trading of private securities important to issuers and investors? Yeah, I would say secondary trading uh, matters for issuers and investors um, for a number of reasons. But first, I would kind of go back and say, you know, private securities are inherently illiquid. And the regulations, you know, that have kind of made it that way date back to the 1930s. And so as we look at the changes in regulations over the last decade, the implementation of technology to space, uh, to this space, and then just the explosion of growth we've seen, investors are demanding solutions for potential paths to liquidity. So, you know, from our perspective, you know, any investor going into a, a primary issuance, they should go in with the expectation that it is illiquid but for issuers, creating a path to liquidity to, for investors helps create better investor outcome and potentially you know, better demand. If you're choosing between one issuer and another, maybe in the collectible asset space, you know, one that supports secondary trading might be more appealing than the other, you know, assuming all other things equal. So you know, it's becoming a demand and, and really a requirement given the growth in the space. Absolutely. And Shari? We hear a lot about blockchain, tokenization, um, you know, do, I'm an issuer, do I need to tokenize my securities if I want to make them available for secondary market trading? Absolutely, thanks for the question. So they don't have to be tokenized. Um, you, can, you can have um, shares on a, a secondary trading, alternative trading system in um, analog fashion. Um, or you can have them tokenized. And there are certain reasons why you might want to have them tokenized. Um, for example, if you have a certain um, stream that works best from an operational perspective or some sort of fractionalization, you may want to tokenize those securities, but you don't, you don't have to. And really, a lot of this works in the back end and is um, transparent to the issuer. Um, so it's, it's up to the issuer and, and what they're trying to accomplish. Got it. And Tim, can I hold securities in my own wallet and trade them with someone else? Is it like as easy as that? Yeah, so you know, the interesting thing with this business is there's just so much optionality, right? Um, there's also some complexities, right? So, so the ability to go frictionless like you can in public equities from one exchange to another to another ATS, it's just not built yet, right? Um, you know, I, w I would say we're probably at first inning here, right? So uh, as this be business begins to mature, the ability to go cross-platform is going to be developed by somebody, right? So in, in its current state, the, the ability to do it is there. Um, it's not necessarily connected yet. So there's a few um, sort of tail cases where that's available, um, but as, as an industry, it's, it's more siloed into that specific ATS. Can I yeah. jump in? If, if yeah. Sure. I, so I do want to mention something just because you, you mentioned wallets and given the events of this week, um, one thing that I want to make sure is clear to everyone is that um, these are different from pure digital assets. Yeah. These, these are not bearer um, assets. They are um, securities and you will have a transfer agent or you'll have a custodian that is, that is responsible, that's a regulated entity that's responsible for the beneficial ownership 
of these securities. So that's why we think it's really critical that you know digital securities are really a, a really nice way to go take advantage of the blockchain-based technology, take advantage of the innovation, but have the, um, the comfort in the, um, all of the regulatory framework that, that um, has you know, spent decades being put together um, to protect the investors. So I just wanted to mention that when you said wallet. Yeah, and, the, and, and so what benefit is, does blockchain play today, right? Like if, if you ultimately you need a transfer agent that's the guardian and the, and, and the determiner of you know, who owns what, what, what benefit is, if there, is there a benefit now for, for blockchain technology? So the use cases, we always work in use cases, and the yeah. use cases that we've seen that have resonated the most with the market have been um, the following. The first, if you're looking to raise capital and you're looking to raise it from thousands of investors um, and do it in a cost-effective way, it may make sense to have it digitized and then on the back end, the transfer agent, the, the custodian, um, has an operationally less expensive um, method of, of communicating or corporate actions, um, uh, any sort of dividend or anything like that, sending those out to those, to those investors. The second um, use case that we've seen is um, actually from the institutional world where an institution is looking to, um, from a fund perspective, either increase the breadth of their fund, so for example, they might have a high minimum, but they're looking to get that fund down to a lower minimum. And from an operational complexity standpoint, by digitizing that fund, you can you can now reduce the operational again overhead yeah. and, and be able to send that out. Same thing with fractionalization of real assets. So those are the use cases that we've seen and that we work with. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was yeah, gonna please, just please. jump in and yeah. say, um, in going, why should we care or who should care? I think the answer is exactly what you're saying. What, what does this technology do? And from an investor standpoint, it shouldn't matter to yep. you whether it's a digital security or whether it's book entry with a totally, you know, tech enabled TA or ATS. You, you care about efficiency, and from an investor, um, it, it can indicate potentially a path for liquidity, because if an issuer is going through the cost of the, the process to, to digitize their securities, that's probably indicative that they might want to uh, enable trading that either then or at a later date. But the example I always use is, you know, I like to kind of compare digital securities to what I would compare like Google Fiber. As a consumer, I don't really care if it's fiber in my ground or through my existing internet connection. I just care that I have the fastest internet connection. And similarly with blockchain to this space, it really is a mechanism to potentially create a common infrastructure for better scalability and efficiencies. Mm. Yeah, well said. And on that note, Sarah, if I'm interested in setting up secondary trading for my company's shareholders, is it possible to host the secondary trading exchange on, on my company's own website mm -hmm. or, and, or app? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the key here is that to enable trading, you typically, there's some exemptions, but for the purpose of this panel, you typically need to connect and be working with an ATS, an alternative trading system, which the three of us all operate. Um, and from there, there's different options depending on who you work with and how you connect. So as an example, um, PPEX, North Capital's ATS, we're really API driven. And so a lot of our partners are able to develop what's called an OMS, an order management system from their platform that connects to our ATS. So no, they're not building their own ATS, they're leveraging ours but they're able to create rails and manage their own ecosystem without sending investors to another platform. So the, the, the feel from an investor's perspective is they kind of, they, they, they join an app, a community, yeah. they're then presented with a, a series of IPO'd at fractional shares in assets, and then right next to that, because the Reg A exemption allows for an immediate path to potential liquidity, yeah. you kind of complete that circuit in exactly. that way, kind of, right. A fully so, proprietary experience is what you have the ability to create with our solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Shari, mm -hmm. could I list my securities on like an exchange or a platform that like might potentially enhance exposure to my shares and, and you know, beyond my own investor base? Is that a thing? Absolutely, I think that's what we're in the very early days of creating and I know um, many of us uh, came from the electronic trading space for equities and built a lot of that infrastructure out. This seems to be, you know, really what we're doing is building out a lot of infrastructure in private markets to enable issuers to provide that monetization 
mechanism and, and really separate the exit ramp of the company with the exit rep of the, of the investor. And by, by doing that, if you're, if you're an issuer, you would um, place your, your security um, on one of the ATSs, and then that would become available to both the, in, in most cases, the cap table of your company, as well as others in that network. Mm. And it's really about building out that network and um, that viability. But again, these are investor markets, not trading markets. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important that, um, you know, if, if IBM had a market cap of $50 million, it wouldn't trade very often either. Um, so it's, it's important to realize where we are in the cycle and um, what, what liquidity really means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. And Tim, where are you seeing the most activity today for secondary trading? Yeah, so I, I think the easy answer is, is all of the unicorns, right? It, you know, the, the companies that probably should be public, yeah. right? The reality is for some of the lesser known issuers, the only people that are gonna trade it for the most part are, are people that already have a bias to that business, right? Mm -hmm. so, so current investors that might be looking to add to their positions um, or others who wish they could invest and they somehow find a way to do it, right? So, I, you know, that profile is going to change. And I think that's what the three of us are really tasked with doing right now is trying to, trying to balance that, that supply and demand, right? You, you need to build critical mass on both sides to get people interested in this business, right? You, yeah. you know, it's, it, and it's not to say that people aren't currently interested. It's just early, right? So uh, to get enough issuers on and, and enough investors on and, and kind of marry them in the same window, that, that's the trick here. So um, I, I don't think there is necessarily a specific industry that is the hot spot, right? Mm -hmm. You know, real estate might be because people are fractionalizing yeah. anything and everything they can in that business. Yeah. Um, but as a whole, you know, th there's fintech, there's medtech, there, there, there's a slew of different profiles of, of companies out there th that are available to trade, right? You know, upstairs, the, the, the uh, Space Ventures group, you know, we were talking with them and, and you know, what would be cooler than, than going on and buying, you know, SpaceX, right? Yeah. You know, and, or, or some of the other businesses like that that have, you know, $100 billion valuations, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think that to, to quickly answer the question is, I don't think there's one specific hole that is, you know, the shining star, mm -hmm. um, but thematically through the business, it's, it's changing and, and, and it, it will get liquid. Yeah, I agree with that. And Sarah, what are the biggest challenges you see today as to why most issuers are not you know, con either concerned about secondary or certainly they're not, most of them are not list yet listing on an ATS, right? I mean, Reg D and Reg CF, you have to wait a year before it's, it's, it's an option and we're still at very early days. But even most Reg A's, like, you know, when you're doing like a one and done raise, I find that many of the founders aren't really thinking about it. Like, they're not, it's not important to them. It's not part of their model. They're thinking about maybe going public one day. Um, they're thinking they have a few hundred or maybe a few thousand shareholders and they're going to be in it for, you know, in it for the long run. Um, so what, do you, what, what are the biggest challenges you see as to why most issuers are not listing their securities on an ATS? Uh, is it awareness? Is it cost? Is it like a lack of interest? Is it something else? I think it's all of the above. Um, I think one of the questions you have to kind of ask is, as an issuer, why do I want to allow or go through the expenses to support secondary trading? And that's really going to look different based on different companies' um, objective. Like a, a company that's raising capital and they're done, they may not have the same incentive as a company that's continually raising money. If you're a company that's continually raising money, you may be concerned that if I allow secondary trading, I'm going to cannibalize my own primary issuance efforts. So I think what you really have to kind of look at is how do you reduce the cost and the barriers to be able to just enable secondary trading? And some of that is, you know, as an example, if you're working with a transfer agent that, you know, might have really out, I don't want to say outdated, but maybe, you know, secondary trading is not something they engage with regularly. And now you need to change TAs in order to enable it. That's a big cost. That's a really big hurdle. So one of the things that we're trying to do is make sure that we're working with our partners and creating kind of the infrastructure at the on, like early onset in the process, whether or not they want a secondary, you know, allow secondary trading, totally up to them. But then if they choose to, it's a lower cost, lower burden, and hopefully results in better outcomes. Because 
really at the end of the day, do you really want investors in your company that no longer want to be investors in your company? And we've seen uh, companies that may not want to continually raise capital kind of address this hurdle through quarterly liquidity windows, you know, mm -hmm. where they allow trading one day a quarter. So, so there's a lot of different solutions, but the key is just to be having it on your mind and your roadmap, you know, and kind of just thinking about uh, making sure that you're setting yourself up to have options and optionality as you move forward. Awesome. And I just want to dovetail on one thing with that. So when, when you look at the motives behind the issuers, right, part of it is just the life cycle of what we're seeing, right? When I got into the business, the average company was going public in about, you know, three to five years, right? It's, it's way beyond that now, probably 10 years beyond that, right? Yeah. So the issuers don't want to feel like they're holding their investors and their employees captive. Yeah. Um, so right now, even the two seats I've had in this business so far, there's just a lot of tire kicking, right? Issuers say, you know, how do I do this? You know, one, is it legal? Is it really regulated? All of that, and, and I think there's an education, uh, you know, point right now um, where there's a thirst for them to really understand this, right? And, and there's gonna be an inflection point, and, and it might be a few of those unicorns that really do start trading almost like public companies that will kick the others into gear. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I think it's, uh, again, it's, it's an interest of, of the issuers, but they still need to get there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sherry, mm -hmm. I got a portfolio in the Bronx. It's <laughs> been in, you know, I got six, seven buildings, I got a couple hundred units, and I'm hearing all the stuff about fractionalization, right? Potential liquidity, I could, I could get out some of my shares. Um, so I wanna, I wanna learn more about fractionalization and I want to ultimately give a path to liquidity to my LPs and others. Um, I like the idea of there being some type of an exchange for my, my assets. How do I, where do I start? How do I do this? Yeah, so um, first off, as with most things, you get a lawyer. <laughs> so you need to make sure it's a, it's a security. Um, and if it is a security and wrapped as such, then um, it simply you know, um, working with a, an alternative trading system to make sure that it's, it's properly, um, you know, set up, properly structured, and that you can onboard um, your, your investor base and, and, and fractionalize it. But it's, that, that's pretty much... That's and pretty and much if I started with the Reg D, let's say, and I raised from friends and families, right? And now I'm like two years after the fact, do I just like call you and, and, and or work with my attorney? Like, what do I have to do to, to actually what are the steps I have to do to get this thing treated and have a bid and ask on my LP interests? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the steps that you would take is um, you would, if it was outside the seasoning period, um, you would have your cap table um, yep. connected in. The cap table, the, the um, individual investors would sign up on the alternative trading system. You would, you would place the security on the, on the alternative trading system, manage blue sky, should that be something that you need to to manage, which are state-by-state state regulations. There are services for that. And then um, after your cap table is set up and, and your security is placed on the um, alternative trading system, you can have that available for trading. Now, there are different trading modalities. Um, and this is something that Sarah alluded to with the quarterly, um, the quarterly option. We see different um, issuers want to do different things. Some want, some that have a lot of retail investors will want a central limit order book type of functionality where it's just a lit order, bid and ask. And it's their firm orders, you can hit, the, hit, the, um, you can hit one of those orders and, and the transaction will complete from there. Other issuers want to pool liquidity for at certain points in time and do a call auction type model. So it really depends on what is in, um, the, what the, the issuer feels is the best way to give their investors access to that liquidity. I want anyone, I want all my friends who are over 18, accredited, not yet accredited, to be able to buy shares in my buildings. Is that, could sure. I set that up? Absol absolutely, they, they would need to sign up to the alternative trading system, um, be onboarded, go through so AML, if I, so if I So if I originally used a Reg D, I could then sign up with an ATS and then position it so that anyone over 18 could then buy shares in the assets? Absolutely, if, if they, they have to go through AML, KYC, they mm -hmm. cannot be sanctioned, mm -hmm. obviously, and um, that's, that's pretty much it. It's, it's not a super complicated um, process, yeah. It's yeah, right, that's, that seems like something that makes a lot of sense. It does. Right? Um, I would add, just to put on the issuer's radar, is blue sky filings. Yep. 
So if you, like with the Reg D, you kind of have two paths. You can go rule 4A one and a half, which is like uh, difficult, and that's where it's like accredited to accredited. It can't really be like marketed. You can't really put on your website or send out emails. But if you have a small group of investors, and, and we actually see this a lot where, you know, some shareholders might want to get out, other shareholders may want larger positions. Um, that might be a good option, or there's Rule 144A, right. um, and using providers like Guard, um, I know CrowdCheck has a solution. Um, that's just something that it's the ATS typically doesn't handle. They will point you in the right direction, but that can also influence who and how you want to enable secondary trading. Tim, are you seeing a lot of tokenized securities offerings like Reg D, Reg A, issuers going through the tokenized? tokenization process? Yeah, I think it ties back to what we were saying before, yeah. right? There, there's a lot of tire kicking, right? Pe people are trying to figure out what it means and if they need it and if it's, it's required, right? Yeah. Um, and, and Sherry made a point earlier saying, you know, it, it's an option, right? You, you can go ahead and, and create a token if you'd like, right? Um, and, and I think, you know, from my mindset, I, I, I would maybe not never, but I, I wouldn't anytime soon make it an absolute requirement. Right, so if an issuer calls and says, hey, uh, you know, I'm looking for liquidity, I'm looking to do a raise, yeah, we, we have tokenization as an option. Um, but I don't think it would be in my best interest or, or their best interest to say, yeah, it needs to be a token, right? So there, there is an appetite out there, um, but I think it goes back to before where there's still this education, uh, you know, what is it and, and how does it apply to me? And, and again, I, th I think it's really important that it's a regulated market and, yeah. and they need to understand, understand that, right? And it's, it, it really just brings some credibility to the market. Yeah. Um, and and it, it allows the divorce of, of crypto for blockchain, right? Yeah. And, and to me, that's really important. Um, and I think that's what the issuers are trying to figure out is, is it truly, uh, you know, just a technology or is it a token like, like a cryptocurrency? Are there some ATSs that, that require me as an issuer to go through a tokenization process in order to be able to list securities on their ATS? Yeah, I'm sure there are. And, 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 and I think in years to come, there, there will be more, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, where things get a little uh, more difficult is one, there, there's a little bit of a cost to it, right? Yeah. Um, so by requiring it, you, you might take yourself out of some business, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also some complexities. We were talking about the, the, the custodian, the transfer agent, right? That, that plumbing all needs to be put together. Mm -hmm. So um, some, some are, are either requiring it or getting there, but I think in the future there, there'll be a lot more mainstream requirement for yeah. tokenization. Sarah, if I want to start a platform that IPOs fractionalized assets in moon rocks or mm -hmm. dinosaur bones or real estate or collectibles, and, and I want to include secondary market trading in my model, right? Um, where, where do I start? How do I, how do I set this up? Yeah. I mean, I think if this is part of your business plan in the next, like, two to five years, it's good to start identifying the partners that are going to support that at the beginning. It really, what we see more often than not, and I'm not sure this, if this has been your experience, one of the biggest hurdles from our side to get um, trading started is just simply the number of intermediaries an issuer has to navigate yeah. to mm -hmm. be able to get it going. So like I mentioned before with the transfer agent, if their broker who did the primary issuance doesn't you know, uh, support secondary trading, if their counsel is not familiar with the blue sky filings and, right. and the ins and outs of that, then you're really having to create so many new relationships to add this functionality. So my recommendation would be, you know, do your due diligence and make sure that you're asking these questions, even though they might not be as important right now for your primary issuance, make sure that you're working with a, a group that's going to be able to support you through the entire life cycle of your business and of, the, of that particular security. Yeah, and and Sherry, market making like are you know you come from a pretty impressive institutional background, and are you seeing market making or institutional investments in secondary share activity on ETSs? Is that a thing yet? Is that going to be a thing? So these are very early days, <laughs> I'll say. And you know we we do talk to I I won't call them market makers. I'll call them liquidity providers. However, you have to understand that that comes at a cost. Um, and, and so that's you know, something that I think is very early in its, um, in, in its evolution. We, we are seeing more institutions interested 
in, in this space, but um, again, it's, it's sort of the exception, not necessarily the rule. So we, we have a ways to go. We consider this the long game. Yeah. And um, so we're, we're really setting up the, the um, infrastructure for the future. But so far, if you, if you have a you know, $25 million, $50 million offering and, and you think you know, you're going to come onto an ATS and, and have a, a two-sided you know, really deep market, that's, I, I, not, we not won't be yet. able to provide that, um, yeah. at least right now. And, and Tim, what's the role of, what are these digital wallets? What does that mean? And what's the role of a digital wallet for issuers who offer <laughs> investors secondary trading? Yeah, you know, I, I would, I would kind of strip it down to its simplest form, right? R really all it is is in an effect an account, right? It's your ability to hold your shares, right? So if you think about the process when you go on and you create a, a Robinhood account or a Schwab account, ultimately your stock sits there, right? You, you go buy shares of Apple and it, and it sits in your, you know, in essence, wallet, right? So it's, it's, it's a, a different term, a slightly different piece of technology, mm -hmm. but ultimately it's just how you hold your shares. Yep. And Sarah, what needs to be done to get real institutions focused on fractional shares of private securities? And so that one day you could hold these private securities in like a Charles Schwab account or like, like any other you know, positions you might hold in that account. What's it going to take? Is it a matter of size? Is it a matter of DTC eligibility? Is it a matter of getting mm -hmm. folks like Schwab interested in, in offering access to these alternatives to their client bases? What's the path look like? How do we get there? Yeah. Well, I think what's really interesting is that as this space has grown, I mean tripled in, in five mm -hmm. years, uh, it's one of the fastest growing areas in the financial markets, and it is mostly uh, self-directed. Mm -hmm. So these are funds and these are uh, individual investors managing their own money, potentially moving it away from advisors, and then you know investing and, and doing as they'd like. So really, we're missing the over 100, million, uh, 100 trillion advisor market um, in the growth and activity that we're seeing. But the thing is, is they're watching and they're starting to wonder, okay, how, how do we get involved in, and as the space continues to grow, it's building credibility um, as to this being a viable option for um, uh, capital formation, for investors to have a small percentage of their portfolio, and I'm really a quite small percentage of their portfolio, and these are t alternative assets. But I would say to actually be able to access that channel, one of the biggest issues is really custody. You know, these are uh, book entry securities. Uh, if you don't have a TA, it could be just the issuer's Excel spreadsheet on the founder's computer. And that doesn't work for some of the Advisors Act rules around custody and being able to report above the line and be able to keep that, you know, AUM on your books. So finding solutions for custody through DTCC's AIP program, through custodial brokers, North Capital is one for alternative securities. I know Drive Wealth um, is also really active in this space, and I, I think uh, that solution will kind of be paramount in conjunction with secondary trading. Sarah, Sarah mentioned that they're starting to listen now, right? Um, Schwab just recently put out a paper or published a report that noted uh, about a third of Gen Z, X, and Millennials have an appetite in trading. Um, alternatives and and tokens in their Schwab account, mm -hmm. right? I would bet you. I mean, I, I didn't. I don't know the data from prior life, but I'd bet you two, three years ago it was near zero, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, as as that appetite from the investor standpoint changes, th these platforms are going to have to uh, figure out a way to, to integrate. Uh, Shari, what's the role of a transfer agent for secondary, and the, and does a transfer agent need to be like you know integrated into the ATS in any way? So we're integrated with a number of transfer agents, but th there does need to be a, a method for confirming from the, the alternative trading system perspective for confirming that the um, you know subscriber that's looking to sell the security owns it and that it's free and clear and that it's um, freely tradable. So you know that's one one intersect um, point, and there are different ways that that, that connectivity can work. Um, it, can, it can be an, a node on a blockchain and there's connectivity there where you have access to view the, that particular, have permission to view that partic particular cap table or it could be other methods. It, this doesn't always have to be um, blockchain based functionality. There can be other APIs um, and connectivity points there and then um, 
a, a communication or methodology for um, transmitting when one investor or subscriber has, has then sold their security so that that can be moved to the other uh, investor. So that's really what um, you're doing when you're interacting with the, with the transfer agent. Transfer agent. And, and Tim, what's the role of a custodian? And do you need one? And why? Yeah, so it's interesting that you get there, and, and, and I think it, this goes back to earlier where there's a whole bunch of optionality, right? Mm -hmm. You can self-custodian, you know, th there, there's a whole bunch of different flavors, right? So, so the reality is the role of the custodian is just to make sure that those shares are held and, and they can be moved when they need to be moved. Right? Isn't that what a transfer agent does? More or less, yeah, and, and there, there's some blurring the lines there, right? Um, you know, ultimately it boils down to, to just being safe, right, and, and making sure that uh, things don't... But disappear. do you get any other benefits by, by having a custodian? Are there, are there brokerage statements, are there other unique, you know, elements that you could provide to, you know, issuers but through including a, a custodian rather than just having a, a TA? Uh, yeah, so... Again, it depends, right? And and I hate to keep doing that, and I feel like I'm, you know, <laughs> waffling here, but the, the reality is it depends, right? Each each uh, transfer agent provides something different, and so do custodians, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it depends on, you know, what you're asking of them and, and what you need from them. But, but as a whole, it's, it's a service that goes back to, you know, I don't, I don't know what date this all started. It's, it's not all that much different today. Mm -hmm. and, and I also think it depends on the investor base. So, for example, you're going to, as you, I always think of it as a continuum from sort of a retail investor, to, you know, investing in a Reg A security or a CF, all the way through to an institution investing on behalf of their client. When, as you start to move along that that continuum, and you and and there's a fiduciary element that's that's um, that that comes into play. Really, that's when a qualified custodian starts to play a more active role um, because there might be tri-party um, custody agreements. There might be other reasons um, to get a custodian involved. That's that's what I've seen in my experience. Yeah, and I was just going to add um, something that we've seen that was kind of to our surprise as far as our fastest growing. Um, kind of line of business around custody is issuers who are wanting to do capital raises with VCs or institutions who had done a Reg A plus or Reg CF um, uh, campaign. So they have potentially thousands of investors. Mm -hmm. So custody can also be a solution to kind of clean up your cap table. If it's held in street name, then it's really showing up, you know, as an entry on the cap table versus 2,500, you know, investors, That's which right. if you're, you know, in uh, looking to raise capital from VCs, you know, uh, I think unfortunately does kind of matter and make an impact. All right, we have four minutes left. I have, uh, I have two more questions. Sarah, is co-listing between multiple AC ATS is possible? I've, we've seen it with, with, with Exodus, right? Mm -hmm. With uh, T0 and Securitize. Um, is, that, is that a thing? Is it gonna be? I think it's going to be, and we actually see it a lot more on the pre-IPO side. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, any ATS that's trading pre-IPO shares, it's the same names, and they're all working with each other and, and talking, and it can be a more like manual and, and negotiated process. Um, on the issuer side, the answer is yes, but that's probably a lot of work and integration and navigating different processes. So you really have to go in with kind of an objective, what are you trying to gain? Um, by having multiple ATS providers, um, I, I think as the space grows, there might be, you know, and, and the ATSs have, you know, kind of both sides of the market more strongly, there could be a reason for that, but uh, candidly, we're not seeing a lot of that today. Yeah, I think a lot of reg NMS <coughs> in, in the equities world, you know, it used to be that there were these ECNs, which are the precursor to the ATSs, and in the beginning, they were sort of all islands, um, and then there, there became more connectivity, and those ATS, or those ECNs that, that sort of leaned into the connectivity really won, and then eventually there was a regulatory mandate that they had to be connected. Um, everyone in the market had to be connected, so I, I think, you know, certainly they'll, um, there may be a, a business need to do it, but go in with a clear use case because it does introduce complexity. And then, uh, you know, as the market develops, I do think at a certain point there'll be a tipping point where the regulatory um, market structure will, um, you know, require it should that be needed. And I think that's a good point. It, you know, looking at, at public equities going back into the 90s, New York Stock Exchange traded just about 100% of, the, of, the, of mm -hmm. the volume for its listings, right? Today, that number is sub 20. Yep. Right, so 
th in, in public equities, you have, let's call it 35 ATSs, I don't know how many exchanges and how many different order types, right? So, uh, you know, this business needs a ton more liquidity before we're gonna sure. get into that type of, uh, of model. Um, but I think, you know, as long as companies are staying private longer, there's an appetite for liquidity, and, and this business goes through this maturation, I, I think we're gonna get there, right? It's, and again, there, there are some complexities from a technical standpoint as far as custodian and, and, and wallets and, and, and everything else that's tying it all together, whether it's book entry versus, versus digital and, and all that, right? So we need to get there, um, but I, I don't think it's happening tomorrow. Yeah. Um, in 10 or 15 seconds, each of you, please respond to the following question. We'll start with you. What are you most excited about in the future for the ATS industry? Yeah, I, I really think what the ATS does is um, it, it opens up that possibility for not just a monetization or an exit ramp, but really product development and product creation. And that's what I get excited about it are sort of these new products that are coming to market that allow retail investors to invest in, in alts. Um, so that's what I get excited about. I think it's opening uh, an opportunity to change how we construct portfolios, um, kind of at the most traditional level. And so I'm pretty excited at the interest and the optimism I see around it, um, kind of getting embedded in more traditional channels. Yeah, and I, I would cut to the chase, right? Volume is what's going to be exciting, right? We, we need more liquidity, and, and managing that that supply and demand curve, uh, I think, is is what's going to get us there, right? You know, to, to Sherry's point, as as we evolve. There's going to be different order types. There's going to be different types of, of plugins and all that. Um, but we need the volume to get there. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. It was, uh, I think this was an amazing panel. Let's get this out to all the issuers who have these same questions. I hope that was helpful. Shari, Sarah, Tim, thank you. Thank you guys so much. You were incredible. And Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.